All right. What's up, everybody? So good to see you. I hope you were able to enjoy the pasta. Um, glad you're here. So this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about discipleship. And today is going to be a, a little bit different <coughs> because we usually have either music, we have a game. But tonight we just have scripture and we, I'm, we're just going to teach um, for a few minutes. It's going to be shorter tonight. But uh, it's going to be fun because then you're going to have an intentional time in your community groups to discuss these issues. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Now, uh, if you haven't been joining us, we started this discipleship series and we define discipleship as taking responsibility for your faith. But I have to do something. I have to apologize to you guys publicly. I already did it with my leaders. I think that that was a really responsible and mediocre definition. Uh, I think it's mediocre because it doesn't really capture the heart of discipleship according to scripture or what the Bible teaches. So that's why I like to update this definition. So if you wrote it down a few weeks ago, just keep it that way. Uh, But I'm going to update it and I'm going to give you a new one um, that I think captures what really Jesus teaches and what we see throughout the New Testament. And so here it is. Discipleship is taking responsibility for your faith. Helping others take responsibility for theirs in the context of your local church. So let me say that again. Taking responsibility for your faith and helping others take responsibility for theirs in the context of your local church. And every single word, every single phrase is intentional and I'm going to explain it why. So let me unpack it this way. When we say taking responsibility for your faith, on our first session we said that God is not actually interested in what you do if you're neglecting who you're becoming. And I know that Ellie can attest to this, and if you're in staff, this is what we've been talking here. The staff is like, there's a difference between doing something and becoming someone. And so oftentimes we neglect who we are. We neglect our spiritual lives, and we compartmentalize. If that's the word, I love that word, but I guess I say we're wrong all the time. Our faith. And so, okay, our devotional time is from this time to this time, but then my interaction with people are from this time to this time, and then the way I drive and the way I think about people on the highway is from this time to this time. So everything is super segregated, super isolated from from our faith and from the way we behave. And so my question is, in what ways are you allowing, allowing God to shape you into the disciple that he has really empowered you to be? In other words, Understanding that your vertical discipleship should be your primary concern, which is this is the process in which you are shaped spiritually. This concept, more than any other concept, changes everything. This really should impact the way you live, the way you behave, you think, every single aspect of your life. Now, that's the first one. The second one is that we want to help others taking responsibility for their faith. Now, let's be honest, and maybe some of you introverted might disagree with this, but life is boring without people. It really is. Life is born without people. Just try to be isolated with no people for a month and good luck with that. And and that's really the type of life that God has called us to be, which is in the people's people's business. To be with people, surrounded by people. We were wired to be in community, to enjoy fellowship, to be in the context of the community of the local um, church. Uh, And so really what we do in this process, we want to make sure we're helping others to be more like Jesus. So we take responsibility in our faith And then step number two is really to take responsibility by helping others to be more like Jesus. And tonight I'm going to teach you a concept or introduce a concept called your one. And I'm going to explain here in a minute. But I think this context and this concept is going to change the way we think about discipleship. And then lastly, in the context of your local church, every word there is intentional. If you are a follower of Jesus, I would expect that you're fully immersed in the life of the church. If you're not, we have to fix that, and you can talk to me later if you have questions about that or concerns, but discipleship cannot happen outside of the context of the local church, Uh, your local church to be more precise. In fact, we see this concept laid out in scripture, especially in the early church. Now, this is not what I'm saying, Uh, and and I'm going to teach this concept later, but what I'm not saying is that you have to meet with people only at church, but I'm saying that this has to be born from the context of your local church, cannot be disconnected. Because if there's no spiritual direction, if there's no spiritual guidance, then it could be dangerous. I know so many people with great intentions that they want to be part of the discipleship aspect of their life, but they're not plugged in anywhere. 
And that's really dangerous spot to be in because there's no guards, there's no barriers, there's no boundaries and accountability in the way that you're living or even in the way that you're directing people. So we need to make sure that we're always within the context of the local church. And church tradition seems to be also leaning towards that uh, side. So once again, discipleship is taking responsibility for your faith, helping others take responsibility for theirs in the context of your local church. And I believe this definition will help us to craft more faithful and effective strategy uh, for discipleship. But before that, I have a question for some of you Bible nerds, some of you guys who like to answer everything concerning the Bible. You think you have the answers and everything. Uh, Even if you don't, you can also answer. But when you look at some of the established, established churches in the New Testament, which one would you say stands out to be the most faithful church. Now, I already told my leaders earlier, so you're not allowed to answer, but you can say another one. Which one stands out to be one of the most faithful churches or church in the New Testament? The church of Galatian, Galatian church, okay. Who else? The Ephesian church, okay. Antioch, Antioch, okay. Who else? Ellie, I feel like you want to answer. Who else? We're just going to start naming all the epistles. (laughs) One One more church, anybody? Okay, great, thanks. Now, I think we would all agree that there's no such a thing as a perfect church. In fact, if you're immersed in the life of this community, you know we are a freaking mess. If you're part of uh, this community, you know that we're not perfect, that we are messy, Uh, we really are. Now, think about it. In scripture, we see this consistent pattern, especially with the Apostle Paul, uh, where they see this thing of, uh, about rebuke or exhortation uh, to different churches. And we see this constant pattern. Paul, an apostle of Christ to the church of Corinth. Just stop praying for you. Timothy says hi. And see, this is kind of the consistent pattern that we find. I would even dare to say that if Paul was alive today, we would probably get a letter. would say something like this. Paul, an apostle of Christ to the church of America. Corinth only needed two of these here you are, number five, just stop. Timothy says, what's up, right? And so I think that Paul, that will be the consistent pattern from the Apostle Paul to the church of America, to the church of the westernized civilization. Uh, Because we know that throughout history, what happens to a church that forgets to remain faithful to the gospel? We see the outcome. We see what happens. And tonight I want to take you to what I think is one of the most faithful churches in the, new t- in the, in the first century. And, and you can claim that there's maybe other churches, but this is one of the ones that we know more about. Uh, and this is the church of uh, Thessaloniki in Greek. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter um, 2. This is one of my favorite books of the Bible. And one of the things that I want us to live with tonight here in the, few, uh, in the next few minutes is a toolbox with practical principles drawn from Scripture that we can apply in our own faith, in our ministries, in our own um, churches. Uh, before we read it, let me tell you why I think the church of Thessalonica is a unique church. Uh, If you read some of the letters, for instance, Stephen said the church of Galatia is a great church. Uh, But one thing that we see, a consistent pattern, for instance, for that church is that, all right, Paul is pretty uh, explicit the way he um, maybe connects with them. And so one of them is that he tells them, hey, you guys are so stupid. Yeah, you foolish Galatians. This is why it says, I'm kind of intrigued to see what the original Greek says there. And then you have the church of Corinth, right? Which is like, man, Paul is really going at them for sexual immorality, for some of the practice, immoral practices that they are doing or executing in that church. Um, but if you read the book of Thessalonians or the first and second Thessalonians, Paul uses a lot of his time or spends most of his time commending them for the things they're doing right. 
In fact, the only thing, the only thing that you're gonna find negative in this epistle is when Paul is addressing some people that were being lazy at the end of this chapter. That's it. And then in 2 Thessalonians, you see kind of him addressing the second coming of Jesus. So it's more an eschatological aspect of the way he's addressing this letter. But I love this because in all of the other letters, you're like, hey, this is what you're getting wrong. This is what you're getting wrong. And he comes to this church, this faithful church, and he goes, hey, this is what I think you're doing right. And let me encourage you and let me explain why. Um, and so if you have your Bibles, when, you, when we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, we see um, Paul celebrating the fact that this church was a model for other churches. In fact, this is what it says. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Or Achaia. Um, and so this is what happens in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And this is the passage that I want us to focus in. The, these next few verses together. And we're going to learn how these people in this church executed this discipleship um, model. So this is what First Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, verse 10 says. You are witnesses, and of course, this is Paul writing, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who... Believe. Now, before we look at the practical strategy, the practical model that these people were doing or Paul was doing, I think we need to make sure that we understand the character of the person who is carrying out the ministry, right? So according to Paul, before you focus on coming out with this amazing system, this amazing strategy, you first have to model character, right? Because a lot of times we were like, ah, I want to disciple people. I want to go evangelize. And then we look at your life or you look at your life and you realize, wow, Like I'm lacking a lot of character in my own personal life. So what are those three main characteristics that Paul is talking about? Look at your text. Be holy, be righteous, (coughs) and be blameless. Be holy, be righteous, and be uh, blameless. Now, I would argue that one of the reasons people are so close up to the gospel, maybe there's someone that you're trying to reach, right? Somebody that you work with, somebody that you go to school with, somebody that you met, maybe some people that, maybe people that you consider acquaintances or friends or family members. I would argue that one of the reasons people are so close off to the gospel oftentimes is because we've contaminated the message of the gospel with a mis-presentation, misrepresentation of Christ. I think that's one of the reasons, really. Yeah, of course, we're not the ones who uh, close or open people's hearts, But sometimes we can play a part in that, right? Of course, God is the one who changes hearts, and he's the one who opens hearts, closes hearts. But sometimes we do a bad job misrepresenting or representing who Christ is. Somebody once said that Gandhi, maybe you heard this story, who was this great Indian activist, um, at one point, he was really intrigued with Christianity. He's like, I want to learn more about Christianity. I'm super intrigued about this whole uh, character of Jesus. You know, you need to understand, for Indian people, for Hindus, and, and for Buddhists, and for Muslims, on, and religious across the world, they believe, about the, uh, they believe in Jesus. They believe in some way or some shape or form uh, that there's this man called Jesus. And so a lot of people were intrigued. People are intrigued about this guy, right? No, we believe in the Jesus of the Bible, God incarnate. But what happened is that he had a really bad experience at a church. It, it is said that he was trying to go into a church and the people, the ushers uh, in the entrance, they told him that he was not allowed to go in. Um, because only, uh, I don't know if it was because of the color of his skin or, or maybe they knew something about him being an Indian person. They say, hey, you're not allowed to come here. And so this is what happened. He said that he'd be a Christian if you were not for the Christians. And I think a lot of times happens the same thing, right? People are like, man, I'm intrigued by the idea of, of Christianity. I'm, I'm all for it about the idea of following Jesus. Uh, but when it comes to Christians or when it comes to these people who claim to love God, I don't know about that. And so the question for me is, you, or for you is, do you want to make a difference to those around you? You want to make sure you evangelize effectively? You want to make sure, do you disciple other people faithfully? Ask God to help you develop godly character, to be righteous, to be blameless, and to be holy. Now let's read uh, starting in verse 11. And here we're gonna see more of the strategy that Paul used. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father 
deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So out of this, I was kind of, I was kind of figuring out, man, how can we craft a discipleship system or strategy that we can implement in our lives, in our ministry, in our churches, even here? And so I was telling my leaders earlier that, man, if you look at my desk right now, there's like books upon books about discipleship. I've read some of them. Some of them I've, I've glanced. Some of them I've skimmed. And a lot of these people come up with all these different systems. And it's really overwhelming because you, you sit down there and you're like, why should I present my people? Why should I present my community? Why should I present my church? I mean, we have really hundreds of systems we have different approaches, different methodologies, like which one should we use, right? And so it wasn't until I was reading this passage a few days ago that it really hit me. And I said, wait, what, how don't, why don't we craft a model that works for us according to scripture? Not for something that I stole from a book, but something that we can come up with through this strategy that was used from Paul to the Thessalonian church. And so I came up with, with five different principles which I think most of them are really practical. Um, and, and so if you can see here on the screen, um, Ryan is going to display here um, in, on it, in any moment. And I call it the Thessalonian Discipleship Strategy. Now, I'm really proud of this because this is not a template. Um, I actually it took me like 45 minutes to figure out how to do this thing, which is amazing because I didn't take it from Google. I didn't take it from a, from a book. Um, so anyways, if you, I know Heidi is, but some of you guys who are the marketing geniuses, you guys are great. I, I'm not. So this is what I came up with, with that we see here from, this, from the text. Especially, so principle number one is this. Identify your one. That's something that we're going to start with. Identify your one. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer it out loud. You have to answer that in your own heart. Who is someone in your circle that you can start meeting with one-on-one -on -one with whom you can help to grow in their faith. Because you need to make sure you identify that one person that you're going to invest in for a period of time. Now, this is what's going to happen to that. I'm not going to tell you what to uh, provide for this discipleship relationship. I'm not going to give you resources tonight because this could take hours. So if you have questions in any moment, maybe come up to me afterwards or maybe shoot me a text or or just send me an email and I can provide you with so many resources when it comes to discipleship. All I'm trying to do is tell you, hey, identify someone, choose someone, find your one. Of course, if you're a guy, identify a guy. If you're a girl, make sure you identify a girl. And the beauty of finding your one is that it's also applicable in evangelism, right? Who's the one person that you know that doesn't know Jesus? Think about the people you work with, friends that you hang out with, people that you spend time with, and even some of your family members. Imagine the impact that every Christian, if every Christian had one person they prayed for and shared the gospel with. So before you even think about evangelism and discipleship, you need to make sure you identify your one. So I think this is principle number one. This is super straightforward. I know it's easier said than done, but you need to make sure you start identifying your one, and which leads me to number two, pray for your one. Man, if we're honest, and me opening my heart to you, we underestimate prayer. So we know intellectually we're supposed to pray, but we don't do it, right? And we know, oh yeah, we gotta pray. But man, this is one of the most amazing, most useful, effective weapons that we have as believers, the way that we can connect and the way that we can commune with God and any given moment, and we don't have to go to a Catholic church to talk to a priest so they can talk to God, but we have an intercessor, is that the word? A mediator named Jesus to whom we can go to the Father, which is amazing. We can do it right now. We can do it right here at any moment, at any time. And the Bible tells us, Hebrews, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And that's amazing. And so this is what you are supposed to pray you're supposed to pray for that person. You're supposed to pray for that individual. Maybe ask God to help you identify this person. Maybe to help you discern how to approach this individual. If God has put in your heart to start investing in the life of someone, here or somewhere else, start praying for them by name. And that's the beauty of prayer, that we get to bother God with it, right? 
And if God has put in your heart to start developing a relationship with someone who doesn't know about Jesus in your circle, pray for that person as well. If there's someone in your workplace, if there's somebody that you just met at a restaurant, maybe your waitress, your waiter, your friend, your family member, pray for them by name. Pray that God would open an opportunity for you to enter into this world. Amen. I, I, could, I would love to do a whole session, a whole series about evangelism. Uh, and, and we'll do that eventually. But, but man, that's, that's what we're called to do. To tell others about Jesus. And then the next step is to disciple them. And that's what we're talking about. So we need to make sure we're praying for your one. But look at, at verse 12. Look at what Paul did with these people. He encouraged them, he comforted them, and he urged them to live lives worthy of God. Because oftentimes we have this impression that discipleship has to do with just sitting down with an individual, looking them in the face, and be, all right, let's read the Bible, right? which is great. In fact, I'm going to talk about that later. But Paul knew that he had to meet people where they, were, where they were first in order to make an effective impact, which leads me to my third uh, principle. Create a balanced plan. And this one is the one that kind of excites, excites me the most. Create a balanced plan. So this is what Paul did, which was so effective in the Thessalonian church. He discerned where each of the people he ministered to were in order to tailor his approach effectively. Somebody, somebody came, out to my office, came into my office today and asked me, hey, what, what material should I give to this person? Um, with giving me no context, I just said, depends, right? I'm not going to give the same material to somebody who's a new believer, or I'm not going to give the same material to somebody who's a believer, to someone who's not a believer, right? Because if you are trying to meet with an unbeliever for the first time, and you read to them the book of Revelation, you're probably going to scare them away. Now, if you start meeting with a new believer, and you decide you want to take them through Gruden's books of systematic theology, you're going to confuse them. And so when I say to make discipleship balanced, I mean that it's no, and this is great, when, I mean it's not supposed to be exclusively intellectual. What do I mean by that? That this is not supposed to, to, supposed to be exclusively intellectual. Let me illustrate this with a story. So my senior year in college, um, God put in my heart to start pouring in the life of another individual from my college. Um, and so I identified uh, an individual, his name was Kevin, and I started praying for him, right? I, I didn't know him. I had seen him, and I knew about him, and so I started praying for Kevin. I don't know why God put it in my heart to pray for him. Um, and what's crazy is that even though I really did not know him, one day he randomly came up to me, uh, and he asked me to, hey, would you be interested in investing in my life, in pouring into my life? And back then, he was either a freshman or a sophomore. And so what we did, we started meeting every Friday after class. Every Friday after class, faithfully, we were meeting for an entire semester and we were just meeting together. And if you know anything about me, man, I was so busy my senior year and, and I'm so, I love to be busy sometimes, which is a great spiritual discipline, right? And, and what happened is that I filled that semester with so many activities, as much as I can be, which was not healthy, of course, and which made me be busy a lot of Fridays. And so this is what I did. I'm like, okay, I already have this errands that I have to run. I have all these activities that I have to, or these responsibilities that I get, I, or tasks that I have to get done. So what I told Kevin was like, hey, would you be interested in not meeting in our same place where we've been studying scripture? And would you come with me to run these errands? And so what we did from time to time is like, if I, I had to get out of the city, go to the suburbs, I would take the train with him. And let me tell you this. Those conversations in the train were one of the highlights of our discipleship relationship. It was so special. It was so sweet because we provide that space, whether it was in a train, in a bus, or we were driving together, we created that space to laugh, to cry, and sometimes to eat a lot of ice cream in the city. Um, but you want to make sure you help other people or you invite other people into your mess. Because what's the point if you're sitting with somebody and you think about discipleship, all right, let's study scripture, let's go through this book, but you're not providing an opportunity for people to enter into your garbage, into your own baggage, into your own things that you're dealing with, then man, it's not gonna be an honest relationship because you're gonna make that person think that you're perfect, which you're not. You will be fooling yourself and you will be fooling him or her 
to pretend that you have it all figured out. And so we need to make sure we create a plan and make it balanced. I mean, man, we can talk about this for hours, but that's all I can say for now. But look at verse 13 to finish. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as, act, as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed a work in you who believe. Pretty straightforward principle. Number four, use God's word. And I know I mentioned this earlier, but use God's word. That should be a given when it comes to a discipleship uh, relationship. Even though Paul's discipleship ministry was balanced, he got to comfort people, hang out with people, laugh, cry with people. He also knew that God's word was the driving force of this strategic plan. In other words, God's word was central to his discipleship relationship. So there could be a chance that you meet with someone and maybe you spend all of those, all that time in recreational activities, playing board games, you go have fun, eat a lot of ice cream, laugh, cry. But there's no foundational content and that could be concerning. In fact, the beauty of discipleship is that you get to empower your one to live out the word of God. That's the beauty of it. This is what 2 Peter 1, 3 says. His divine power, talking about God, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. If we didn't have any other book in history, if we didn't have the works of C.S. Lewis, if we didn't have the works of the Institutes of Calvin or whatever theologian or scholar that you can think of, according to scripture, really, we have everything to grow in our godliness in this book as we grow closer to our Lord and Savior, as we grow closer to the God that has decided to disclose himself in these pages, which is amazing, we get to know him deeper through scripture. So you want to start somewhere? Start with God's word. And lastly, principle number five, repeat. Repeat. Go and do it all over again. That's the goal of discipleship, multiplication. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. The goal of discipleship is that you would equip people, empower people to do it with another person. And they will repeat that process. And you will repeat that process. That's the whole thing of this diagram, right? That you will identify your one, that you will pray for your one, that you will create a balanced plan, use God's word, repeat. Same thing over and over again until God calls you home to glory. That's the goal of discipleship, multiplication. Remember, taking responsibility for our faith and helping others take responsibility for theirs. So your job is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Now let me, let me finish with this. Um, you need to make sure if you're a believer, if you claim to follow Jesus here tonight, you need to make sure you understand what you signed up for when you decided to follow Jesus. Right, with everything else, if you have MPW, if you have Alliant, if you have any other service that this town offers in your home, there's a contract, there's an agreement, there's something that you have to sign. Same with your house, same with your apartment or wherever or whatever you, or your debit card, your credit card, whatever you do, there's an agreement. There's something that you sign up saying, hey, I authorize these people to do this or I know that I'm signing up for this. Now, with, with being a follower of Jesus, same thing. Same thing. When you made that decision, you sign up to pay the cost. And that's something that I want you guys to understand. Why? Because discipleship requires time. It requires discipline. It requires prayer. But it also requires love. Because love will enable you to love the person as you should. And that will lead you to be like, wow, I should be more concerned about the soul of this individual. I should be more concerned about the eternal state of this person that doesn't know Jesus. I should be more concerned about this person who sits next to my cubicle every day and I never talk to this individual. Or I never talk to them about Jesus. How are you loving others by being concerned about their soul? Now my practical invitation to you tonight as we close this series, and next week we're going to have a panel discussion, is how would you, or would you consider joining the mission of making disciples who make disciples? And guess what? All it takes, at least to start, is a willing heart. And so this is what um, we're going to do, and I, what I want us to do here at the point. Um, we've established a system uh, with community groups. 
That's what being working for us might not work for another church. Other churches might call it different, C group, D group, whatever they might call it, who cares? As, as long as we are intentional with this strategy or system that God has put in our hearts. There's so many systems. There's so many strategies that we could use. I know that some of you guys wish that we did things differently. Hey, I went to this young adult group. I went to this church, and they did it this way, and I'm glad. I'm glad that you were part of these things. But we need to understand that every place has its own culture. Every church is different. Every, every context is different. And every leader has been given uh, a personal and different assignment for a reason. And so I'm going to be the one who's going to stand before God someday. And I'm going to have to give a reason for the things that I did, for the motives that I had, for the people that I steward, for the sermons that I preach, for the content that I give you, for the materials that I offer. I'm going to give an account someday. And so will you with the people that you steward. And so what I want us to do is to be faithful with those things right now. This week, next month, this year, this season. Because I don't want us to get to heaven and then God asks you, hey, you know, you say you were going to share the gospel with people. You got saved when you were 13. You never shared the gospel once. And here you are in front of me. You're 85. You never shared it with anybody. I don't, I don't want it to be that. And so I want to challenge you with that. And again, we established community groups here at the point which we're trying to figure out how to do more effective a ministry, how to, how to impact you and your community. And I think that we can improve so much. There's so many things that we can improve, do better, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I would ask of you is that you would allow those who are your spiritual leaders, whether that's your community group's leaders or, or their pastors or the authorities over you, that you would trust them. And if there's anything that you are concerned about, is there anything that you don't really trust, that you would come up to them with character rather than telling other people or writing it down, and you would come up to us, you would come up to them and be like, hey, I'm struggling with this idea, with this concept, with this vision, with this mission, and we would love to chat out how we can improve this place rather than you in your mind, you know, creating bitterness because we didn't do the things that you wanted us to do. And that happens a lot. We don't want that. We want to prove together. We want to be faithful to God's word. We want to be faithful to his authority. And so far, we have community groups. And I know that what I've said right now, it, has, it, it gives greater emphasis in your one. And, and we still have to figure out how to do that in the context of which, or where we find ourselves in currently. I'm still trying to figure that out. But what I'm encouraging you is, is just to take this and to implement it in your life. If you're not a, um, a leader here, if you're part of a community group, maybe the things that you're learning on Thursday nights, the things that you're learning on Sunday morning, maybe you can grab another person and be like, hey, you, would you be interested in learning about the spiritual disciplines? Would you, I know that you are a new believer. Would you be interested in going through the book of John, the book of Mark, the book of Ecclesiastes? Would you be interested in going through material with me so that we would b- both sharpen one another and that we would grow closer to, on our relationship with Jesus. That's what we want. It's not about my glory, your glory, or Calvary's glory. This is about the glory of God and be obedient to his call. So I'm not here to motivate you. This is not a TED talk. This is not a motivation talk. I'm here to equip you and to empower you to be the person, the disciple that God has created you to be. Okay, so that's our goal. That's what we're doing this series that I really believe in, and I hope that you take it to heart, that you pray, that you look at this thing, all this good information, and then, and then you would ask God, how, how can I start? How can I identify my one? How can I start praying for them? How can I make sure I, I am, I'm making a plan? And how can I make sure I use your word, God? And how can I make sure I repeat the process? So let me pray, and then we'll send you guys into community groups. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for uh, being good to us. Lord, I pray that, um, that you would speak to us here in the discussion groups, that it would be good, that it was, would not be about the things that we're doing, um, uh, that, that we could improve without us being part of the solution, Lord, and that we would, instead of pointing fingers, Lord, that we would also have more thumbs, that we would be like, yeah, I have to work on this. I am falling short in this. And that we would be part of, of, of the change that you're bringing here to Calvary, to this local church, to this community. Help us, Lord. We want to be disciples who make disciples. Help us to be faithful. And we pray all these things.